I'm still thinking about that prelude, right, with the bells. Uh, it just fits so nicely with the, with the service and stuff. Um, it's like we planned it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Holy Spirit, breathe new life in me. Breathe new life. Breathe new life. I wonder um, where we can use some of that new life in our lives right now. Yeah. Where we could use a little bit of that time of refreshing. Where we could just breathe in God's spirit and to kind of exhale some of all that negativity, some of that tension, some of the frustrations or what have you. And be able to just receive God's spirit into our lives for God's new life to be in us so that we don't have to hold on to that old life. Um, Today is Pentecost Sunday, and I hope that as we go into our message today that you will ponder and think about where and how God's Spirit could invade, invade your life so that you will be able to discover God's new life in you. Pentecost Sunday is when we set apart and celebrate the birth day of the church, when the church was birthed over 2,000 years ago when the Holy Spirit came down and was poured out upon the disciples gathered in a room. We're told about 120 strong. And just very quickly, if we look at the book of Acts, very quickly, these disciples, empowered by the Holy Spirit, changed the world. So in light of that, in light of that context of what this day signifies, um, I want us to, I want us today to think about the church. We're going to look at the church and think about the church and what God's word may have to say to us today. And so um, I want us to keep it real today. Keep it real. So as I go into reading the scripture, just as Ms. Gale did a fantastic job of, right, describing that. Right? I want you to imagine what that would have looked like, right? What the Holy Spirit coming could have looked like. And at the same time, I want us to imagine what the coming of the Holy Spirit could look like here and now. Not just 2,000 years ago, not thousands of miles away, but here and now to the disciples gathered here in this place. So will you join me? Uh, we will go to Luke, not Luke. We've been in Luke. We're going to go to Acts uh, chapter 2, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 13. And as I said, let's keep it real today, all right? Acts chapter 2, beginning on verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly From heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya, belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, 
they are filled with new wine. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. We're told that when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place, and then suddenly, like, a, like the blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separated and came to rest on each of them. That's what we find in verses 1 through 3. And so what we imagine is Sounds of violent winds and tongues of fire invading this house where a group of believers had gathered. And nowadays, when many of us think about the Holy Spirit, a lot of times it's really the gentle spirit, right? The soothing, comforting, whispering, encouraging, the make you feel good kind of spirit. And there is evidence for that in the Bible because the Bible speaks of that kind of spirit as well um, when it describes the Holy Spirit as an advocate, as one who comes alongside to comfort, there's that spirit, and that is true. But that's not what we see here, right? Today, we see the spirit acting in a very different way from that comforting spirit. Here we have violent winds, tongues of fire. The wind, the word for wind here is is the same word, actually, we see in the book of Genesis. Genesis, chapter 1, when God's spirit was hovering over the waters, just before God puts everything in motion and brings all things into creation. So the same spirit that we just read about, just imagined, was the same spirit, that same creative spirit that we saw in Genesis in the very beginning. So wind, we see God as wind or air or spirit, breath. But we also see the spirit moving in the world as fire, as we saw described today. Fire, when God appears to Moses in a burning bush, fire. And then later we see fire in terms of pillars of fire leading the Israelites out of slavery through the wilderness onto the promised land. And this morning, we recognize the same spirit in the book of Acts as both wind and fire. God's spirit has been unleashed again, and a new community has been created on Pentecost. And right away, we see, we see when the Holy Spirit gets inside of these believers, something happens. There's movement, there's change, there's excitement. It's a little scary a little scary because they've never done anything like that before. But nonetheless, what happens is we see a group of disciples that are lit up on fire, and they can't hold it in. And immediately we see that they're actually outside now, on the streets, unable to contain what God is doing through his spirit in them, and, and and that spirit and that power is unleashed through words, speaking out into anyone that would hear. And the really crazy thing about this, the really crazy thing, as opposed to the other crazy stuff we just looked at, is that when they're outside, right, this is 120 people. There's maybe like 120 people here, right? 120 people, and they start to speak when they're outside. They start to speak as the Spirit is leading them at once, and then everyone within earshot, everyone within earshot, say that they understand what these disciples are saying, that they're able to hear it actually in their own language. And to give us a taste of all the types of people and the groups of people that were there, Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, lists for us a sample size of the, of the kind of people or the groups of people that were there. That's what we saw in our reading. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Cretan, Arabs. This is why you go to seminary, so you can say these words like you know how to say them. (laughs) Yes, this is how you say Pamphylia. Yes. But all saying, right? But everyone that hears, all these people, right? All these people groups that have gathered, all of them are saying in our own languages 
we hear them. And they're speaking about God's power, God's deeds of power. And we want to hear more. And that is amazing. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I've, I've said this before, and I think it bears repeating, so I'm going to say it again, right? Which is, I find that amazing, right? 120 people speaking to hundreds, if not thousands, and everyone's saying they understand. Everyone's saying they want to hear more. And I say that because my job also requires for me to speak, right? And so every week I get up and I speak to one people group. And many of you I've seen over and over and over. And I still don't know if even like a half of you even understand what I'm saying. Like, what is this guy talking about? And here are as many as 120 people, disciples that are speaking at once in tongues. Hundreds and thousands of them hear them and they say, we understand. We want more. We want more of this. But we also see, to kind of finish up this, the, this, this passage here, we also see that at the very end that they also mention those in the crowd who weren't really listening, right? Who were looking at their phones, yeah? <laughs> They're making jokes. Ha ha, they're just drunk on cheap wine. And I'll just say this, I don't want to dwell on, I don't want to dwell on that too much, is that you're always going to have people that resist the spirit. You're always going to have people that are sort of the haters, right? And haters are going to hate. And so I think just early on, we just have to make up my mind that we have to take the good with the bad and let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving because we don't want that the hate, to hijack or rob us of the new life that God is pouring into us. And so we say, go with God, and we will go with God. Okay, so now I want us to fast forward 2,000 years. We're keeping it real today, right? So fast forward 2,000 years, and here we are in 2022 on Pentecost Sunday. All the believers, well, some of us, some of us have gathered physically in this one place to celebrate Pentecost, the birth of the church, when the Holy Spirit was poured out. And so now, after that story, that old story has been recounted so that we have imagined it, reenacted for us here. Having heard that story again, I want to ask the disciples today here that have gathered, Is that what you want? Is Pentecost Sunday what we want here at Central? Is that what you want in your life? Violet winds and tongues of fire, speaking in tongues and to all these different people groups, people that maybe you're not, you're not used to rubbing elbows with. Do you want Pentecost today? Do you? What would that even look like, right? What would Pentecost even look like today? And so that's, that's been my, my prayer, my reflection this week. How can I look at this text how can this speak to my present circumstances, my present situation now in this church, in this town? What would Pentecost look like? And this week, because I've preached on this text before, even at this church, and I've only been here less than a year, I've preached on this before, but this week, my focus actually turned to the first verse, to the, fir to the beginning of this text, which said, they were all together in one place. They were all together in one place. That's the baseline. That's where we as church need to start. All in one place together. But, but we are not all together in one place. And I'm not, I'm not even talking about 
physically, like in person, right? Those who aren't with us because they're worshiping online. I'm t- you know, because there are, because I, but I, again, let me, let me make myself clear. Because there are real and legitimate reasons for some of us to continue to worship online, at home. So thank God for the technology that allows us to do that, right? Because it's, it's safer, it's healthier for them, so great. Because we still want you, even if it means online. We still want to be a community that way. So thank God for that. And continue to be mindful of your health and the health of others. Yes. But, because it's been like over two years now. But, if you are able to be in person with us, then I would love that. I would love for you to be here physically in one place with us to come back and to join us in person. Because I think there is something different. There is something different when we are physically together. Our physical presence has an impact, has a footprint when we gather to fellow believers, to connect, to build community, to bless others, to give encouragement to others, and at the same time, be encouraged and be blessed by others when we can be together in person. And maybe, maybe there was a time when we felt like, yes, we are, we are all together in one place. Maybe there was a time that we felt like, yeah, we were all together. But for reasons beyond COVID, it still feels like we're still not all together. And the word that I thought of that is missing (laughs) is connection. That's That's the word I thought of, connection. We are not connected as a group, as a, as a body of Christ. But we were created in love to be connected to God and to one another. And, and so one of, the, one of the reflections I had as I looked at this passage and what it could mean for us was, how can we try to get back to that baseline of connection as a body of Christ? Because I think... That is important for us to be in a place where we can be together, where we could feel like a community, where we could feel like we have brothers and sisters in Christ who can be a source of encouragement and support and strength and even rebuke when it's called for. So how can we today bring about some connection, at the very least here in our church, in our church family. And, and, so, I, and so I wanted to share that, that I'm grateful to our church and for some of the resources that we have because I feel like that is something that is important and that is something that we're going to try and do in a very practical and tangible way. We have a legacy committee, which means we have a legacy fund, uh, which allows us to provide ministries or be able to carry out projects that maybe otherwise we couldn't, you know? And so this year, we've approved, uh, we've approved a lot of stuff, but I just want to point out two, which was a couple of applications that will allow us to come together as a church and meet in a meaningful way. Uh, One of those is a grant. for a series of meals that the church will host. Uh, It's for you, but if you want to invite a friend or somebody, your neighborhood that you think might be good, fine. That's fine. This idea actually comes from um, our bishop, Ken Carter, who recommended this to our churches, knowing that we're coming out of COVID. (laughs) Knock on wood, right? We're coming out of COVID. And so as we come out of COVID, when we've been isolated, right, when we've been lonely, when we've been separated from one another, um, for us to come together to share a meal, 
a catered meal so you don't have to worry about getting the green beans or the mac and cheese or who's got this this week. No, just come. Just get the date and the time and just come so that we could share with one another. And he, our bishop, asked us to think about just one thing. Think about one thing for those that gather. What is one significant thing that has happened to you during these past two years? What is one significant thing? And I think that's what we missed, right? That's what we missed in these past two years when we've been separated, when it, when, you know, it, it was normal to get together, but we didn't, we, we weren't able to do that in a normal way. And even now we're still, there's a little bit of like anxiety when, when it comes to coming together. And, and so when we do this, how can we share about important things that has happened, that have happened to us these past two years that maybe we haven't been free or safe to share? And so... We're, we're looking at about four meals. We'll see how the money goes. But we'll see. we're looking at about four meals come maybe, maybe in, the, in the fall, August sometime. Maybe, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. We're, we're working on that. But basically, we want to have maybe about four meals set up where we invite our church and your neighbors, if you want, to come to share a meal, to have some meaningful conversation and fellowship, and to just ask, what's something significant that's happened to you? How can we come around and encourage and support you, right? Because I heard someone say, you know, that we may have all been through the same storm, the storm of COVID, right? But we have not all been in the same boat. Does that make sense? We've been through the same storm, but we haven't been in the same boat. And so let's come together to share in order that we may be able to find encouragement and support for one another in this community that we call church, and let this be a place where it's safe to come together. And on the same vein, in the same vein, there was another grant that was approved for just that reason, right? There's this one that has to do with COVID and for you to come together and to be able to share, but we also wanted to bring back congregational meals. And so we've got a certain amount of money set aside, and so throughout the coming year or so, the staff parish committee and wings um, are, have kind of agreed to work together on this because the money's there, right? The money's there to work together to provide a congregational meal for the next coming year. I, I'm, I'm not even sure how much we can do, but just so that we can come together to enjoy one another's company again, to share our lives again. That's why, you know, like in a very small way, when, you know, during the service, I ask you to greet each other because that's something that we don't get to do that much. And so this is, think about like an expanded version of that, right? A way for you to just feel normal again, right? It's normal to gather, to share a meal and to talk about, hey, this is what happened this week, or, or just whatever is going on. Hey, let me show you my grandkids again for the 10th time, or whatever it is. Let's come together and just enjoy one another's company and invite God's spirit to be there, to breathe again new life into me and into us and into our life together so that we can feel like we are a community again and not just a bunch of individuals that happen to come to this church on Sunday morning. I think we've missed that. And I think it will be good for our souls to gather together. I wanna, I wanna just add one more thing, but like I said, this isn't about me just telling you where you can find life or how God could bring new life into your life, because I want you to continue to be praying that, thinking that, to see how, can, how God, how you can actually how you can hope to have God invade your life. But I just want to give one more as a catalyst for you to start thinking about ways that you need some refreshment. You need new life in your life. And so another way I want to talk about this is another kind of connection that I feel like has been missing. Um, in our reading today, we saw that we saw the Holy Spirit poured out to the disciples, and the disciples hit the streets, and they engaged people. Um, but underlying the coming and the going out, there had to be 
there had to be that encounter in the middle where the disciples had to be open to cooperate, to collaborate with the Spirit to be able to go out and carry that out. Does that make sense? Yeah? I mean, the Spirit is coming. It's like, it's like when, you're, when you're communicating, right? <laughs> I just had this conversation this weekend. When you're communicating, you think you're saying one thing, but that doesn't mean that's what the person heard, right? And so you need to follow up. Did you hear what I said? And they're like, yes, you said this. Okay, good, now let's move forward. And so I feel like what had to happen was the Spirit and the disciples, there had to be some collaboration to be able to make that work, carry it out. And in the, in the United Methodist Church, we call that connectionalism. This is, we're very big on connectionalism. We're, we're big on the fact that we're connected to the other Methodist churches in the area, right? That we have a connection with them. That there are networks of churches that are already kind of structured and set up so that we can share and serve together for the sake of God's kingdom. It's, a, it's already been there, and I want us to revive that. I want us to reclaim this connectionalism, not just us here at Central, but to feel like we can partner with other churches and other organizations in the area because we want to bring the good news to our city, that the cause is, is Christ, and it shouldn't be what Central is about. It shouldn't be what that church is about, but it should be about what God is about. How can we make it about the mission? That was the idea. And as I thought about that idea, because that's been missing for us as well, is um, one of the highlights for me this year was when we had Holy Week and Easter. And what did we do? We partnered with Aldersgate. And it was wonderful to hear not just my voice speaking God's word, right? And I'm sure you guys were relieved to not just hear my voice yet again, right? Jesus again, yes. But that's, this time somebody else is going to say it. But beyond that, I mean, if you, were, if you took part, do you remember this this part of the sanctuary was filled, like 40 people. I don't know. Is that, is that about right? 40 people. 41. I mean, think about what we can do when we can come together and work together. And we have one goal, and that is Christ. And we have one goal, that is how can we build community? How can we breathe new life into this city rather than what's in it for me? Rather than looking to our agendas or our egos but saying, what, is, what does Christ want? And how can we come together to do that work? That kind of connectionalism has been missing. And maybe for the last two years, we had a good reason. But I think now, that is another way that God's spirit could breathe new life into this church as we look to build partnerships with communities and groups and churches in the area. Because I believe if we're going to impact the world for Jesus and be signs of the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, then we have to cut out the whole being competitive thing. We have to cease worrying about who's going to get the credit. Who cares who gets the credit? And stop comparing ourselves to the church down the street. They're like this or like that. And realize, and realize for ourselves that God shows up at times other than 10 o'clock on Sunday morning at Central. So I want to ask that as we look to this kind of connectionalism that we could build moving forward, let's move away from business as usual, how we've always done it, that self-centered, that self-enclosed kind of church, and learn to form partnerships, healthy partnerships with other believers, with other organizations, so that we could work for the good of this city, of the people around here and beyond, and invite God's Spirit into that. Invite, allow God's Spirit to lead us into that, to collaborate, to cooperate with the Spirit, and to forge these connections that will allow us to carry out God's work in a more powerful way. Those are two ways that I saw that we could bring about Pentecost in our church, and in this community today. And I want to invite you, because the Holy Spirit wasn't just poured out on the preacher, but it was on everybody. And everybody was out speaking. 
God's word. And you might speak a different language than me, right? Which is a good thing. Because I'm going to speak more of the theological, seminary, whatever. But you have, you have people in your lives, you have groups, and you were able to speak in a language that speaks to them. And so I want to encourage you to think about ways that God can speak through you. What are the ways that God is wanting, desiring to bring new life into those relationships, into those people, into this community? Because that is a way that we can see and have Pentecost today so that next year we're not just talking about what happened 2,000 years ago, but we're going to be talking about what we are doing right now. So next year, maybe what we'll do is instead of talking about what happened 2,000 years ago, we'll be talking about what you guys have done this past year. And I'm still going to be here. That's what Rocky said. I'm still going to be here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going I'm to look for stories. I want to see where Pentecost is happening. And it's not going to happen just because the pastor said so. It's going to happen because God has moved in your life and is going to move you out. And I pray for the outpouring of God's spirit upon you and through you onto the streets where we can engage people where they live. Let's celebrate Pentecost through our lives and our witness in our relationships in this community. And so as we close this message, I just want us to pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe new life in us so that this new life can go forth, to breathe new life in this community. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.